this is, as we all know, uh, our book of prayers. It's not a prayer request book, but it's full of many names that uh, are in need of prayer. And the Lord knows their wants and needs. Uh, as we could, uh, hold on, I don't want to forget the sticker. If you will send us an address and your name, a good address, Pastor Woody will send you this sticker. It says, Rockin' Country Church is praying for me. We're a small church in Kemp, Texas with big prayers. And Correct. prayer does work. Uh, we've seen it uh, for ourselves. So if y'all would please remove your hats, gentlemen, and uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you today. We lift this book up to you, the book of names. Lord, we know that you know each and every one of their hearts, Lord. We'd ask that you would go inside of them, Lord, and, and help uh, cure what ails them, Lord, whether it be spiritual or physical, Lord, we pray for all of them. Uh, we continue to pray for George, Lord, and his recovery. Lord, we ask that you would send the message through Chris that we would open up our hearts and receive it so that people can see Jesus on the outside, Lord, and we use that spirit, Lord, to glorify you in everything we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I want to ask everybody over here to lean this way so we don't get off center here. For some reason, Pastor Woody doesn't come here, and everybody except for two on that side has decided to take the day off. So, so if you see me looking this way more, you know why. Is everybody doing all right this morning? I guess I should get my eyes on where I can see. I am glad we have four seasons. Well two in Texas, really hot and really cold, and we're kind of in the middle today. Um, I would like to think that it was going to get cold enough to kill off the bugs, but it never does that here in Texas. Yeah. Yeah, and if it did, then, you know, it wouldn't be Texas. Um, it's good to see everybody. Uh, we have two children uh, for Children's Church today, so we'll get that started here in a few minutes. Uh, Pastor Woody will be back next week, or he better be back next week. He should be on his way back today. Um, so uh, I enjoy getting up here and doing this, but uh, he's a much better preacher than I am, and I'm just thankful that he's asked me to, to help out here, and I just thank all y'all for uh, supporting me in this. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, pray up, and we'll let the children go. Dear Lord, we thank you again for letting us come before you, Lord. We just, we just humbly ask that you'll lay your hands upon those people who are in need today. We know George is, is, um, needs help in his healing, Lord, and there's so many others out there who are in need. We ask that you'll lay your hands upon each and every person here in this building, Lord, that you'll open their hearts and their minds and allow them to receive the message that you have given. I ask that you'll empty me out and fill me with your spirit and that you will deliver this message, Lord. Not allow me to get in the way in any way. Uh, just please uh, give the message. Uh, again, we ask that Pastor, that you watch over Pastor Woody as he makes his way back. Please be with Miss Terry and everybody else in the church um, who is in uh, traveling or bundled up warm at home today. Um, we thank you for all the blessings you lay for, upon us, Lord, and we thank you for allowing us to still come together as a church, as a group of people worshiping you and learning more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, children, y'all can go, uh, well, I would say wreak havoc, but y'all have Brent, so Brent will be wreaking havoc today. So I know that he, he is much more in tune to that. Um, we're going to start off in Mark 8, uh, if y'all want to go ahead and work your way there. Last week, oh, that was Brent. I, I tell you, he, he is a big kid at heart, I tell you. He, he is a blessing to our trail life troop because... No matter how wild the children act, we still have him who acts even wilder. So <laughs> it, it keeps everything in focus. Um, last week I had talked about uh, disciple, being a disciple. This week I'm going to work on that some more. Um, it's important we understand that and understand what our role is in the big picture. But if we'll go to Mark 8, verse 34, uh, we're going to start there. still hear some pages okay 
uh, verse 34. When he had called the people to himself with the, his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the sake and the gospel will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world if he loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. We must be committed. Um, being a follower of Jesus, a disciple, a Christian, um, isn't a half-in, half-out thing. We don't ride the fence. Uh, as we talked about last week, it's a narrow path that we follow, and that's a, there's a reason for that, because we have to be committed. We have to be committed to Jesus. We have to be committed to our fellow Christians. It's important that we all come together and, and lift him up. And Jesus has proved that by every time the numbers of his followers grew, he would do things. He would... He would he would double down, I guess you could say, on his teachings. He would say things like, drink my flesh, or eat my flesh and drink my blood. Um, he wasn't for the numbers. He wanted the ones who were truly committed to him. He only wanted people who were serious to be his disciples. It's more about quantity than, it's more about quality than quantity. Wow, I'm flipping around today. Um, the modern church, as we've seen, is more about quali quantity. Um, it's all about numbers. And, and there's nothing wrong with numbers because even in the book of Acts, they talked about numbers. But having a church full of people admiring the lights and the singers and the, the pastor as he gets up there and, and gives his message isn't what it's about. It's about God. It always comes back to God. Um, and again, numbers, I mean, there's even a book in the Bible called Numbers, so we know that we're supposed to talk about numbers at some point, but it's not all about that. Um, the gate's narrow, but that doesn't mean not to talk to everyone uh, you can about Jesus. We have to be focused on God. We have to be focused on um, start over. I've gotten so far off track. Um, it's not about numbers. It's about Jesus. And just because we're trying to, to build a following doesn't mean that we don't talk to the people out there. We go to talk to the people in the communities about Jesus, but we're not doing it so as to build up our church or our congregation. We do it to build up the, the following of Christ. And are we ashamed of Jesus? It's easy to be all about Jesus on Sundays when you come to church. It's easy to do it at home and around friends who you know also believe what you believe and follow Jesus. But when you're out at a restaurant or in a grocery store or someplace like that, do you talk of Jesus? Or do you shuffle on away? If, if somebody's in need of prayer, even if they don't approach you for it, do you pray for them? These are hard things, especially in the times we live in now to where you know that most people, and, and truly, sadly, most people don't either don't believe or don't claim to believe because they're afraid of being canceled in this modern society. So last week we talked about being a disciple, what it means, what it should look like. Uh, we talked about a disciple of Jesus follows his teaching and learns all they can so they can have an intimate relationship with him. A disciple is transformed by Christ. They become a new creation. They are no longer the person they were before Jesus. A disciple lives a God-centered life. A disciple is called to be holy, and a disciple does not go it alone or sit at home to avoid other believers. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. He's not a fan. There's a lot of fans out there. Those people who on Sunday get up and they cheer, Jesus, Jesus, he's our man. If he can't save us, no one can. And then they get out into the public or they get to work and they go, Jesus who? Um, 
that is what is now um, modern Christianity in a lot of ways because the people think of church and being a Christian as a social event. They don't think of it as what it should be as a way of life. A disciple has two primary jobs when it comes to the kingdom of God. That's worshiping God and telling others about Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. That's Matthew 22, 36. This is the greatest command. We do this through our obedience to God and to our worship for God. We shall have no other gods but him. And that is what our personal job is in uh, being in obedience to Georgia. We do, I mean, George. I got George on my mind. God. <laughs> Sorry. I think George is on everybody's mind this week, and it just kind of got away. Um, we do what God asks. We thank him for everything, even if we don't think it's good. And that's another thing a lot of people do is they don't thank God for everything. Because even the bad, as much as we don't like to hear the bad or suffer through the bad, will be good for the God's kingdom, uh, if for no other reason. Uh, it's tough to go through those valleys, so you should always prepare for those in the peaks. When you're up on top of the hill, always remember valleys will come. Not if they come, they will come. And then you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 22:39. Telling, teaching, lifting up your brothers and sisters in Christ, if you truly love God, if you truly love Jesus and love his creation, you will reach out and show the love daily to all who are around you. And that's not, I mean, that's primarily people, but also we should um, take care of his creation. Um, I'm not an environmentalist by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, we were put here on this earth to uh, take care of it. That was one of our primary jobs. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. That's Matthew 28, 18. Jesus the, son, Jesus, the Son, is God. So didn't God already have authority? God the Father did. God the Son, Jesus, had authority. He was the one who actually created the earth, the earth and all things on it. In Hebrews uh, ver chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, uh, if y'all want to go there. Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the worlds so Jesus did make the worlds and after Jesus paid our debt the sin debt we could not pay when he was hung on the cross he conquered death by becoming resurrected and leaving the grave his father gave him full authority and why is that even important to us? Because without that authority that he has, how could he have given us the power of the Holy Spirit? And that is the source of all of our power as uh, believers and disciples. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And that power is important because if you ever say that you feel lonely or you're alone and, and you, don't, that you, you don't want to go out by yourself, he's with you. The Holy Spirit is always within us. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit protects us. And the Holy Spirit directs us. And as I would said last week, in new believers, part of our job as more mature believers is to help them learn how to be still and calm and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Whenever we go, where, whenever and wherever we go, he, um, he is there supporting everything we do, supplying what we need, and while we go and while we go and be witnesses for Jesus, and witnesses are exactly what we are. We weren't, we have not physically seen Jesus, 
But we have the Bible, God's word that affirms Jesus is who he says he is. Just like a witness in court, we go out and tell others what Jesus has done for us. Witnessing to other people isn't about quoting scripture and, and preaching a sermon. It's about telling them the wonderful things God has done in your life and assuring them that if God, they allow God into their life, he can do the same for them. The changes he's made in our life, the things we have experienced through the work he has done in our lives, we are his representatives. Because we are no longer who we were, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for Jesus, and we give our tes testimony uh, to the people to allow them to, to know what we have, uh, what God has done in our lives. Uh, we're not trying to impress people. We're not trying to tell them, look at how horrible I was and look at how wonderful I am. We want to make sure that people know that God can do all things. He can change all things. No matter who you are or where you are, he can make it happen. In everything we do, we should point to Jesus. Because no matter what we think we're doing, we can do nothing without him. When Jesus paid the ransom for our sins, he not only released us from the eternal consequences of our sins, he changed our address. As disciples, we no longer are part of this world. Our home is now waiting on us in heaven with the Father and the Son. Let's all go over to John 14. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And we're going to be in verse 2. John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know and the way and where I go you know and the way you know as a disciple he has prepared us a place and it's not just for us it's for anybody who calls him Lord and who uh, follows his, his teachings um, we're no longer residents here on earth when we accepted Jesus, we became aliens in a foreign land. Let's flip over to 15. It should be about a page. John 15. We're going to start in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, world, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you in my namesake, because they do not know him who sent me. And we all know there's a lot of uh, people out there, a lot of pastors and a lot of churches that talk about once you become a Christian that your life will be easy. This, Jesus uh, doesn't agree with that. He, he told us that here on earth we would have trials. And again, if this is your best life now, then you don't have much to look forward to because our best life is going to be up in heaven. And just as when God looks at us, he no longer sees us, neither does the world. 
when we go to Jesus, when his blood poured out on the cross, God now sees Jesus whenever he looks at us. And the world hates us because they see their father's enemy, Satan, um, Jesus. Hang on. The world hates us because when they look at us, their father, who is Satan, sees Jesus just like God sees Jesus. In John chapter 8, um, verse 44, when Jesus was talking to the Jews, he said, You are of your... You are of, the fa of your father, the devil, and the desire of your father you want to do. So Jesus even said it to the Jews. And we, we, I think we talked about it last week, that if you're not of God, you're his enemy. So if you're not of God, you're of Satan. And it's a decision that we have to make. So when the people look at you, they're not looking at you. They're looking at Jesus. We're going to pick up in uh, verse 22 in John 15. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. The NIV says they would not be guilty of sin. We all have sin. Whether we know Jesus or not, we are sinful people. But once we know Jesus, once we know God, we know our sins. And once we know our sin, we are expected to turn away from our sin and repent. And this is why we're not called to judge lost people. Lost people who don't know God, they do what lost people do. We should only concern ourselves with telling them the good news and showing them what Jesus has done for us, not condemning them for what they do that they don't know is necessarily wrong because they don't know Jesus. Just as when Cain killed Abel, there was not a law against murder. So he was blessed, even though he had committed murder. Verse 23, he who hates me hates my father also. If I, had done, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would no longer, they would have no sin. And again, the NIV says uh, not to be guilty of sin because we all have sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. And this really tops off where we're at is if we're truly Jesus's disciples we are commanded to go into the world and talk to those who do not know Jesus but because Jesus shines a light on their sins he shows the things they love they worship the things that define who they are that gives them status and popularity he shows these things to be sin and they don't like it they do not know him, but because he brings all their dirty secrets out into the light, they hate him. And they don't know why necessarily, because they don't know him. And because we are his and no longer of the world, because we represent him, when we go out and talk to these people, we shine his light into the dark places. We are the ones that they feel like are judging them and calling them out. All we're doing is telling them about Jesus. But in that, it gets pointed out. And that's why, in most cases, now you can be a Christian because the definition of Christian is so diluted this day and time that people don't think much about it. But when you start talking about being a follower of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus, then the words like sanctimonious and uh, hypocrite and all these other words come out because they don't want people to know what they're doing in the dark. But as his representatives, we are to talk to them about him. We're not to talk to them about their sin. We're not to tell them. We should never walk in and start with, you're a horrible person because you're doing this. We should always start with, Jesus loves you, and this is what he's done in my life. If we go in, I guess some people would say hot like that, then you immediately turn them off, and they think that you're just there to judge them. But he's not here, so it falls to us to go out into the world and talk to him. Because when he was on the cross, he said, it's finished. And that wasn't discipling was finished. His job was finished, and he handed it off to us. 
So with all the persecution and everything, why do we go out into the world and talk to people? What prompts us to go out and do that? And that's because we love these people. We may not know them, but we know God loves them. And because God did all these things for us, we love them also, and we go and talk to them. And again, don't be afraid because Jesus told us, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that was Matthew 28, 20. That is the Holy Spirit within us and is always with us, supporting us, lifting us up, and telling us what we should say and what we shouldn't say. He's the one that gives us discernment. So now we know what a disciple looks like and what it means to be a disciple. So how do we disciple others? Do we just call them aside, invite them to church, maybe to a Bible study? Do we simply tell them all we know about Jesus and hope that's enough? Most people will say, I'm not a teacher. I didn't go to seminary. I don't know the Bible well enough to teach. We are all, we all still have much to learn about the Bible. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the Bible. It doesn't matter how much studying you've done. There is still much to learn. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible or have a theological degree. Theological degree, is that right? Uh, I get tongue-tied. Uh, you don't have to have these things to go out and talk. You should model the one who is discipling you. And if you're not being discipled, you should find somebody to disciple you. Someone to look up to someone you trust, and someone the same sex as you are. And this is very important because this is how people in high up places in churches and, and good, good Christians fall, is they start helping or discipling a man, would do a woman or a woman discipling a man, and that draws you close and intimate through the Holy Spirit. And that gets mistaken for true intimate relationships and that's why it's important that if you're a woman you disciple young women and women men do the same it's all about you may feel like you won't fall into that category and there's a lot of men out there that say that and there's the same number of men out there who have fell into that it is so easy uh, Satan's been at this a long time he knows how to push the buttons and he knows how to make it happen so our job is to avoid the situations and not try to show that we're tough enough that we can get around it. Many of my mentors, mentors um, that I've learned from a lot of Bible studies and all that are online. Um, I never had a lot of in-person mentors. And where the, the in-person thing is always good to have, you just need somebody who has who's a good role model I guess and it doesn't matter how old you are it's all about how mature you are in your faith and being around somebody and listening to somebody who's more um, mature than you are because it's all about getting fed one-on-one -on -one. and even on the online stuff it generally is directed as a one-on-one -on -one study more than in a group a group is good our Bible studies we have here is really good but it's also important that you're in a Bible study and that you have somebody to do the Bible study with and if you still don't know what it looks like to be an disciple and to show others look at Jesus we should always model Jesus he is the only perfect man that was out there and that's true for women too if you want to show others what Christianity looks like, what being a disciple looks like, you can't go wrong by modeling Jesus. Um, he didn't have a weekly Bible study. He didn't go uh, and have a weekly service so he could preach to his guys. He didn't just meet them a few hours a day. The disciples walked with him, observed all he did, how he did it, and how he treated others. They not only learned what he verbally taught them, but they observed who he really was. They truly learned from his example, and that is what discipleship's about. It's not just about showing in a teaching format. It's about being an example. And it's important for the disciple to know also, because it's, oh, it's important that the disciples know what to do if they mess up how to handle reject, uh, failure and rejection. You should be able to show how humility works and how to deal with all the world, um, deal with the world when you're going through these things. 
You should also show them how to ask for forgiveness. The disciples' lives, disciples' life is not easy, and we must model humility and love at all times. A lot of times when we start looking up to these people who's discipling us, we start feeling like that they make no mistakes, that they do no wrong. And that's how a lot of, you know, big names in ministry end up falling because of the fact that we all make mistakes. We all do things we shouldn't do. But we need to make sure that we have the humility and know well enough that we can step back and go, my bad, and ask for forgiveness. To me, that shows more about somebody's personality and somebody's just who they are than anything when they can admit they're wrong and ask for forgiveness. So let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 5. Well, verse 5 is where we're going to start. And as I had said last week, when it comes to discipling, everyone should be being discipled by someone, and everyone should be discipling someone, or multiple someones. You don't have to stick with just one, because your disciples will become disciples. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Sumerians, but rather, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel as, and as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Sometimes you need your message to be more focused and more pinpointing on a certain group of people. So there will be times in your life when you will maybe disciple just one person or one area of people who's suffering from certain things. Jesus originally sent out his 12 to, talk, to, to tell the Jews. But once the Jews rejected him, then he sent out the 70. And I'm going to, y'all don't have to go there and read this from uh, Hebrews 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go telling everyone they met the good news of his uh, coming and to continue to grow his devoted followers. And then in Acts chapter 1 verse 15 is the 120. And in those days Peter stood up and in the midst of the disciples altogether the number of names were about 120. So it grows as you go along. And like I said with Jesus it would grow to a certain point and then he would Make it, he'd step it up to the next level and he would run off the ones who weren't that serious. When Jesus commanded his disciples to go therefore and make disciples, he was also talking to us. When we go out into the world proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, people will respond, and then what? And that's what we talked about last week. Then what? We as disciples have to be prepared to help the people who are coming freshly into the fold. We don't always have to sit down and help them directly, but we need to be able to point them in a direction. A church where discipling happens, a Bible study. Um, I even from time to time point them to, to my favorite pastors or Bible study or men's ministries online. Uh, sometimes it's easier to ease, that, ease them into that that way. And again, we are always learning. We never reach a point to where we don't need discipling ourselves. We will never know it all. God will allow us to know what he wants us to know when he wants us to know us. But we must remember it's not all about the Bible. It's about God. It's about Jesus. We can read the Bible cover to cover. We can study it day in and day out. We can know every word and every verse. But if we don't know God, it's meaningless. There's a lot of atheists in this world who can quote scripture front to back, but it means nothing to them. Yes, yes. Um, you know, the, the demons know God more than most people, better than most people do, because you try to know your enemy as well as possible. But it is important 
that we know these things, but if we don't have him in our heart and we don't allow him to direct our lives, then it doesn't matter how well we know him. Uh, this is our God, the one who created all things, Yahweh, the great I am. God uses the Holy Spirit to teach us. Jesus said in John 14, verse, chapter 14, verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he may abide with you forever. And I t covered this a little bit earlier. The Holy Spirit is our primary uh, teacher. He opens our eyes. He opens our hearts. He is the reason every time we read the Bible, we get something new. He's, all, he's constantly looking for new ways to get us as much God as we can handle but it's how much we can handle. If we were giving all there is to know about God in one failed swoop, our minds would melt. Um, and we'll never understand him. I, you know, I've heard people say that, that they wish they could understand every aspect of God, but if we could, would he be God? I mean, if, if you could think like God could think, then how much of a God is he? We're put here to serve him and to do the things he calls us to do, but we will never necessarily understand why. That's why we have to have faith. We have to be able to, to stand back and just say, okay, God, you're in charge, and do it. And, of course, that's why, as we find in Bible studies, every time you read the Bible and study the Bible, you get new revelations of God. And it's not because God changes. It's because he's given us something new, a little nugget or a, a big chunk, depending on what we need on that time of day or that day. Um, and God is still speaking to us. He's not speaking through the prophets or the Holy Spirit, holy people or the burning bush like he did Moses. He's speaking through his word, through the Bible. This is how he talks to us. Now, the Holy Spirit does speak to us in that little small voice inside our body. But the bulk of what we learn and the bulk of what we're told comes through the Bible. Um, and it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. There must be discipleship internally within us with the Holy Spirit, externally with the, those around us. And if the Holy Spirit is leading you to learn from someone specific, ask. If there's somebody that you think has a lot of information and things that you might want to know, Ask them if they'll disciple you. They may or may not, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And if you see somebody who needs a discipling, approach them and ask if you could work with them, to talk with them, and, and sit down and, and show them things. We're a community, and the only way we grow is to come together. And the only way we're going to survive is to come together. Because the church, Jesus' church, the one he left in the first century, has been splintered into little bitty chunks just between um, denominations and the different beliefs and this and that. And now with COVID, it divided up churches into smaller segments. And to survive and to, to come together and to, to be the church, we have to come together. It's no secret at this point that there's a lot of people who want to see the churches shut down. And if we don't stick together, then they just pick them off one at a time. So just because you go here, and, and the people here I know are, are not like this, but there's some churches that believe they're the only church there is and they don't interact with other churches. We can't be that way. We have to talk to people. We have to communicate. We have to even understand some of their teachings. My wife went to the women's encounter over the weekend. I've been to the men's encounter several times. And it's a non-denominational event to where there are other teachings. Some of them I don't necessarily agree with, but it's good to know what other people think and how they live so we can um, either prepare ourselves to tell our children this isn't true or we can rethink what we have learned. Because I know there's a lot of people who have been taught one thing in the Bible and then when they got older, they realized they were taught wrong. Uh, we have to let the Holy Spirit work within us, and we can't be locked into one thing. We have to uh, allow the big things don't change. 
God came to this world. I mean, Jesus came to the world. Well, God, God, Jesus came to this world, was born of a virgin, lived 33 and a half years, died on the cross, paid the debt for our sin, arose, walked to the earth for 40 days, and arose, uh, and, uh, arose to heaven and, and is interceding for us. Things like that are non-negotiable. But we should be open-minded on some of the smaller things. And that's not saying that they're right. That's just saying we need to make sure that we are right. And that's why we need to always make sure we dig into our Bible when we're told stuff and confirm what's being said, either right or wrong. All right, I got off on a tangent. Um, and it's all about obedience and God's will. Uh, let's turn over to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Oh, I still hear pages. I'm sorry. I need a little timer up here. <laughs> okay, is everybody there? Yes. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admon admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. The Holy Spirit is always teaching us, and it's not just in reading. Uh, being a disciple is not always about planned teaching. You may be driving along listening to a song, a new Christian song you've heard a thousand times, and one little something in it, a verse that, that you know you've read, suddenly clarifies. You, you suddenly see what the verse really meant. The Holy Spirit is teaching you in that way. You may be reading over a devotional that you've read before and a, one scripture that you've read a thousand times and suddenly it just jumps off the page and you get a look at what you thought was what it meant and suddenly you're getting the Holy Spirit is giving you another way to look at it. And that's what it's about. That's why they call it the Living Bible because it's ever changing and it doesn't change but how the Holy Spirit has you receive it changes in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 it says train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it and when we're talking about discipleship, we're not just talking about adults. We're also talking about children. It's very important with children. We have the trail life here now, and we're getting ready to kick off the American Heritage Girls. And even though it's fun outdoor adventure and the boys are running wild and things are crazy all the time, it's about God. That's why we do it, to teach these boys about God and to teach the girls about God. And we do it in a different way than you would normally think as far as Sunday school. Because Sunday school is still, like in here, we're sitting down and we're calm. Boys, surprisingly and amazingly, can learn when they're running around screaming at the top of their lungs, slinging mud at each other. But they do. Uh, we, have, we have been seeing it more and more, and it's, it's really important. Because we're we're, we, we, as adults, are responsible for the raising of the children, the grandchildren, and all the children that fall within our influence. It's not the school's responsibility to teach them how to make a living. It's their responsibility to teach them, but we have to make sure that they are teaching them what they need to learn. It's not the Sunday school or the church's responsibility to teach the children about God. It's their parents, it's our responsibility. Bringing them to church helps them to learn and helps give them a foundation of what it looks like but ultimately we as as disciples should make sure that they know and of course there's no guarantee that a, a child will follow Christ but if we give them a good firm foundation and the godly people that they know bathe them in the word then when the hard times come they lean on it it's 
just like reflex. Once you get used to doing that, the habit is always there. And I think they say like 75% of children that go to college come home not knowing Christ or rejecting the call. Most, I'm trying to think of the word, most schools, I guess colleges, are anything but Christian now. And even a lot of the Christian schools are not teaching biblical facts. So it's important that we make sure they understand. And if they ask questions that we don't know, we need to find it. And, and we should tell them. We shouldn't say, well, ask the pastor. Some things that's fine, but, but we as, as their parents need to be able to answer their questions. Because, again, that comes back to them always trusting us and coming back to us whenever there's an issue. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I don't think I've been in the Old Testament today, so we've got to go at least once. It's kind of like we found going on a cruise. They've got to go to one foreign city so they can send you through. Uh, um, my mind just went blank. Boy, I tell you, my mind's failing me today. Customs. So you've got to go back through customs. we always got to take a, a turn through the Old Testament because even though we don't talk about it as much as... Uh, I think we should. There, there is a lot in here that's tough to read, but is important to know. So we're in chapter six. We're going to start in verse four. Oh, I'm not even the right chapter. Here, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to teach your children. Hang on a second. This weather's got my throat dry. There are a lot of resources out there. And Lori is teaching Bobby. They do Bible study several times a week. And you should do a Bible study with your children uh, on their level. But it's always important to make sure that they know the truth of the Bible. And, you can, and, and it needs to be fun also. But I do know that as I grew up, what I learned as a child in the Bible, there was a lot of liberty with it, especially when you talk about Samson and Delilah and how Samson was this great, wonderful, heroic man. No, he wasn't. But it's important for, for the children to know the truth of the Bible. And if you have a good lesson plan or a good book um, with pictures, because they like pictures, um, you can learn a lot. I know in reading some of Bobby's books to him, I have learned things that, honestly, in, in, in the Bible, when you're reading it, it turns into a little complicated and then trying to figure it out. And then you read something in a child's book, and they've turned it into this simple little conversation that you go, well, why couldn't it have been made that easy here? But we don't talk the way they used to talk, especially in the Old Testament. And again, we can just start simple. Uh, it's always good to start with the, the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. Um, since the first time I heard others talking about discipleship, I really didn't understand it. Again, I didn't. I heard it a lot, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, I've learned a lot in this study to prepare for these sermons because most of the time when you think about discipleship, you think about just strictly teaching. And it's not about just teaching. We are teaching, but we're also leading. And again, being a disciple is not something you do. It's who you are. It uh, starts within you and it comes out. Uh, the Holy Spirit leads us and we need to completely surrender and allow God to work through us to do the things that, that need to be done. We must model what it means to be part of the kingdom on a daily basis. 
And the simplest form of discipleship is just setting an example for others, be it believers or non-believers, children or adults. What you do, people see. The old adage, do as I say and not as I do, does not apply because people see who you are. And that is the most important part is for people to see who you are. Because they learn from us whether or not we want them to or not. Um, we need to put the word into practice every single day. Our families should not see a different person at home as they see in church. That happens too many times. I struggle with it at times. It's, it's easy to fall back into that old life, into the, the person you used to be. And when you're at home, you're in that safe space where nobody sees it. But people do see it. Your children, your grandchildren, your wife, your neighbors. So it's important that we, that we model what we teach, uh, who we claim we are. Everything we do, whether we want it to admit it or not, affects everybody around us. There's nothing we do that in one way or another doesn't affect somebody. We all represent Jesus. We are God's diplomats, and we have to remember that when people deal with us, they're dealing with God. And they should feel as though we treat them that way. As we move through this world and as it gets tougher and tougher to navigate we have to come together as as a group we have to hold each other up we have to support each other and we have to truly show the world what it means and it's not easy as it's been said by many it's easy to become a christian but it's hard it looks pretty simple but when you get down to being what you're supposed to be it's tough because that flesh is always always fighting to get out so men if you'll remove your hats we're going to go to the Lord in prayer again dear Lord we thank you for this message we thank you for the words that you've given me I pray that it's touched people that uh, if not here then online whenever they may see it Lord we thank you for allowing us to continue to learn we, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that's within us we just ask that you will uh Give us what we need when we need it, that you will allow us to touch other people's lives as we go through our days and continue to remind us that we are the example and we should show it to people. Even those who are hard to get along with and difficult to deal with, we just pray that you will uh, allow us to have the wisdom and discernment to, to treat people as you said um, If we have a situation and we have people coming against us, that we should be extra nice to them so as to heap hot coals onto them. We want people to see your love and your, your generosity, Lord. And we want to ask that if, if there's somebody watching today who does not know you, that you will lay your hands upon them, that you will draw them to you, Lord, that you will touch their lives and show them what it means to be a Christian, all the good things. We talk about a lot of aspects of it, but in the end, we get to spend eternity with you, Lord. And we would like for everybody we know and everybody we come in contact with to spend the, the rest of their eternity with you also. And if you don't know Jesus, I ask that you uh, open your heart to him right now, that you'll allow him to touch you and allow him to come into your life. And we ask that you'll just repeat this prayer. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for my sin and arose from the dead. I turn my sins and invite you to come into my heart and my life. I trust and follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I ask all these things. Amen. And again, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, anybody who needs prayer, I ask that you'll come down here front. Yes. Yes. If you are a veteran or if you were married to a veteran, hold the music, please. Thank you. If you're a veteran or uh, married to a veteran, if you'd please stand. Because we want to honor those people. Um, what those people do when they 
go out into the world is the reason that we can stand here today, that we can come before the Lord without having to hide in caves as they do in some countries. And we thank all y'all for your services. Okay. And if you need prayer, we'll pray over you also. So anybody who needs prayer, come down. And, uh,